evening and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Jeannie Hoffman and I'm a rehab psychologist here at the University of Washington and the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System. Tonight we're very pleased to welcome our four panelists uh, for a unique discussion of challenges and um, you know, both the challenges and the positives of having incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, we really, this topic came up um, over a few different discussions about people feeling like um, they didn't really fit here at the forum and they didn't really always feel like uh, we addressed issues and concerns that were related to them. And I think that I really, as a um, somebody who works on inpatient and outpatient rehab, to me, I see the whole spectrum of spinal cord injury from people who walk to people who are on ventilators. And so I guess I really hadn't understood or really thought about the unique challenges that come with having uh, the ability to ambulate uh, with spinal cord injury. And so I really want to thank our panelists for joining us. I also have the a pleasure of introducing Dr. Jones, who um, is a spinal cord injury specialist here at the University of Washington, based at Harborview Medical Center. And um, she is joining us to kind of help answer some questions and address any issues that come up as we discuss. So please welcome uh, our panelists. We have uh, Bruce, Ann, Michelle, and Jaden. And I'm gonna do just a brief introduction of each of them um, to get us started. Um, so I'm going to start with Bruce at the end, who um, has <clears throat> tetraplegia. He has 6'6 six, six, uh, tetraplegia. And um, just to go in a short version, he, uh, at this point, really uses um, ambulation using lost strength crutches um, pretty much all the time. He occasionally uses a wheelchair around the house, but, but really... Um, um, uses uh, loft strand crutches and walks around the, uh, most of the time. And he didn't start really walking until about nine months after he was discharged from inpatient rehab. Next to him we have Ann, and Ann has paraplegia, and um, she, about 95% of the time, is using her crutches to get around, same kind of loft strand crutches to get around, and um, really uses them um, you know, from the time that she left um, inpatient, she was using a walker and a wheelchair, kind of half and half, but really has moved over time into using them most of the time. Next to her, we have Michelle, who has also a C6 uh, tetraplegia, um, as well as central cord syndrome. And that changes the picture a bit, being that she really can't use kind of crutches um, to walk very well. Um, but she does use a walking stick, as you can see with her. Um, but in terms of getting around the most, um, in the community, she really uses the power wheelchair. Um, and so at home, it's primarily, so about 50-50, um, using uh, the walking stick and then um, the wheelchair. And then we have Jaden, who has a C5 tetraplegia. And he also, um, about 50% of the time, using um, wheelchair and 50% of the time, walking using a cane. Um, he also, um, both uh, Michelle and Jaden also um, started walking during inpatient rehab, but both, um, well, I think Michelle, you discharged with just using um, a cane and just walking. It was a while after that before you actually were able to get um, your power wheelchair. And uh, Jaden was, you know, using a walker then more so rather than a cane, but has uh, advanced from there, right? Okay. So in terms of getting started, you know, I think one of the things that um, has come up a lot is kind of the question of how is this different and how is it similar to anybody who's in a wheelchair all the time or has a more complete injury? And I think, you know, bowel and bladder issues just come up right at, right up front. So I'd like for us to be able to talk a little bit about that. And so Bruce, I'm, if you could just kind of describe what kind of methods you use and whether these are even issues for you and we'll start with you if that's okay. Um, yeah, well, it's uh, uh, not, it is an issue, it's not normal. Uh, I do, uh, I don't need to use catheters anymore, though I did use them for about the first four years. So as over time, a little less and less, and then finally uh, stopped. I do use a crede method to help void my bladder. Um, I need, I don't need to use like a very rigorous bowel program, but I do need to do digital stimulation and that sort of thing. So. I mean, it's definitely, definitely affected. Yeah. And that, continues. And yeah, it's, I guess it's stable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
How about you, An? Um, so I also have a neurogenic bladder. So I started with using the intermittent catheter after discharge and then moved on to um, using it less and less like Bruce until now I do um, I don't use it anymore but um, I still have the urgency and the occasional um, accident so um, I do have to use um, the restroom more often than normal people usually have and for the bowel program um, I also have um, I also have to do digital stimulation but um, I also have a a schedule, but not that rigorous schedule, too. How about you, Michelle? Uh, quite similar, uh, neurogenic bowel and bladder. And uh, it's not normal, but it's not terrible. So I, I used to use a catheter, but less and less as well. Uh, I really have to watch sort of my uh, liquid intake. And I know I take in less liquid than I should take in, but I don't want to take in too much because then uh, I'll have an accident. So I really have to I limit my intake and then I just try to go to the restroom on a regular basis. And, uh, and occasionally I do have accidents. Um, I just kind of get used to that. <laughs> Tried various things. And with bowel, um, again, it's not normal, but I just figure, close your ears. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I don't go one day or two days, you know, eventually three or four days, then I'll have to go. And uh, <laughs> uh, and it all basically sort of works out that way. Uh, for me, as far as bowel function, it's pretty normal, but I do have urgency and accidents occasionally. Uh, and then for bladder function, I've never had to cast, but I have a lot of like urgency and frequency and accidents. And yeah, so just like wearing pull-ups all the time, just in case, and it's a, it's a constant problem. It I seems like it. there's been a lot of change over time for people. And I'm curious, Dr. Jones, if you can kind of speak to the fact of like how as a physician you monitor that and kind of help people figure out because you know, from the time of inpatient of, um, you know, kind of how best bladder management should happen to kind of this change over time. How do, how do you kind of instruct people or train people on that? I think it's one of the biggest challenges, whether you do have a complete or an incomplete injury. Um, and I think, you know, the long of the history of it all is that people used to die from spinal cord injury because of renal failure. And so we really learned how to manage bladders a lot better. And so I think with that history, it's just on our mind a lot in, in terms of spinal cord injury medicine. Um, I think some people can be ambulators and still require catheters and others, you know, and just as our panel just said, others may not, but there is that getting into a little bit more of that history of, okay, well, you know, how frequently are you going or how much urgency might you have or, um, you know, are, do you feel like you're having other issues? Because as much as someone may not have a catheter, they may still have other issues and require medications to try to protect their bladder and protect their kidneys and whatnot. Um, I think as we do surveillance and yearly screening, we still keep a good my, eye on um, ultrasounds just to make sure that there is no other damage going on. Um, you know, in some systems, even folks that are ambulatory, uh, they still may get urodynamics pretty regularly because the bladder can change with time, just as you all have said. And so it can be that you may have uh, evolution in, of ability to urinate, or it could be that you could develop more and more spasticity in the bladder, or excuse me, overactivity in the bladder, and that can affect, impact the rest of the bladder as well. So, you know, in our system, we don't do urodynamics quite as much, but that is something that is used in other places to sort of monitor, especially in these cases where you may not be able to tell as much clinically as from a history um, as much. Um, and then when it comes to the bowels, I think that uh, the reason I said that that was okay, Michelle, was that <laughs> bowel programs are what works for you. And the goals of anyone that has a spinal cord injury is continence and having being able to plan for it if you can't plan for it yourself and um, you know not having other symptoms. So if it is that you aren't going that frequently, but you aren't having accidents, you're able to eat okay, and you aren't feeling nauseated, then if it works for you, it sort of works for me, um, and that's sort of how that is. So 
Um, but I think it's it's a constant conversation with your physicians, and if you feel like something has changed or whatnot, like that's that's something you have to talk with your physician about to get the right answer. So. Thank you. One of the other hot topics that often comes up is um, pain after spinal cord injury, and I think that um, the pain discussion that we have is is pretty similar across all, but I'm would like for you guys to talk a little bit about kind of pain issues and kind of what do you, you know, is that an issue for you? And kind of, if it is, what are you doing to manage that and how does that impact your function? I'll start with you this time, Jaden. Uh, so as far as pain, I don't have a lot of pain. Uh, I do have some hypersensitivity, like mostly on my arms. And so uh, that didn't develop until probably three years post-injury and has just gradually gotten worse. Uh, so at first I could just not wear long sleeves or I could wear like compression gear and now like my own arm hair bothers me and I'm always like trying different topical and herbal remedies, trying, hoping something might help it, but uh, yeah, I haven't figured that out, but just deal with it. <laughs> and is it a constant problem? It fluctuates a little bit, but it's pretty constant. How about you, Michelle? Uh, well, I have pain pretty continuously, uh, and I have different kinds of pain. And uh, it's kind of weird, like before injury, you just think, I don't know, pain seems to be like one kind of thing. But post-injury, it's kind of like, I don't know, people who are around snow a lot realize there's lots of different kinds of snow. There's lots of different kinds of pain. And each one kind of tries to get to the top of the leaderboard for like which pain is like the most bothersome on that day, and then I try to manage that one. But it's a pretty limiting um, thing. Pain is like one of my toughest things, and the chair is part of pain management for me because the more I move, the more it hurts. And so if I could not move, then, you know, that helps with pain. So when you talk about that, uh, about all the different kinds of pain, do you have some names for those, or has um, oh, Dr. Yes. Jones given like, some names? I have like my Bernie pain, you know, that's like the neuropathic Bernie pain. I feel like my ulnar nerves, or my arms, and my feet, and my hands, and my torso, and you know, basically my body. And then I have like a squeezy pain, which is you know, sort of around T8 in the in my back. It's kind of a band around my uh, around my chest. That just squeezes the more I move. Mm -hmm. And then I have like a, like a, like a, more like a muscular skeletal pain mm -hmm. in my neck at this point of injury and then down my back. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I got all, those are kind of the big ones. Bernie, yeah, squeezy, okay. and pain in the butt. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those are pretty probably accurate names mm -hmm. for them, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You got real names for those? No, I was just going to say you tend to have dwarf names for your complaints. So. Oh, I do? <laughs> so, squeezy and burny. That's and right, yeah. <laughs> if we could only limit it to the mm, seven, right? That's right. Um, I'm curious about what you what strategies. Jaden's tried a lot of things that nothing has been super effective. Have you mm. found things that have been more or less effective? Well, yeah, like rest in the chair. Mm -hmm. It's good. Massage helps, or heat, and... Uh, cold or tens, anything to like kind of distract me. Mm -hmm. uh, meds, of course, different kinds of meds, you know, or, yeah. I think that's kind of the whole range. Mm. How about you, Ann? Um, I mostly only have lower back pain because of um, my back muscle trying to compensate for my leg when I'm walking. So if I walk like a long time or if I walk longer distance, then my lower back, my lower back pain kind of flares up. But overall, it's like kind of constant, but not too bad until I do a lot of walking. And regarding strategy to manage it, um, I try to um, do exercises and back and stretches for my back. And I also try to have like uh, something to support my lower back when I sit and like when I drive like in a car. Well, I have probably moderate neuropathic pain in my, basically the parts of my body affected by the injury. The, my right arm, kind of a diagonal line down my chest everywhere below. And uh, it's, um, 
most of the time I don't notice. Now that we're talking about it, I notice that it's like, oh, yeah, there it is. Um, and I also realized that I forgot to take gabapentin. I take gabapentin about six times a day because it seems to have a short half-life. It seems to be better if I take it. Take it more frequently. It's just a little more even if I get, if I forget or get behind it, that can be bad because then I just won't catch up. Mm -hmm. um, so that, um, I've also, um, sometimes we'll get it at night. We'll wake up in the middle of the night and have basically, my skin is on fire. And I have also been, uh, uh, been using cannabis to help a mixture of CBD and THC, but probably more CBD, which also does help with spasticity, both bladder stuff and lower extremity um, spasticity and tone. Mm -hmm. So I take that at bedtime, and that has reduced the probability that I'll wake up in the night um, pretty significantly. Was that something that you um, talked to your doctor about, or did you talk to other people that had tried it? Did you kind of, I, I, I'm curious about just the process, because yeah. I think that a lot of people are trying to use yeah. cannabis for um, right. pain and spasticity, and so tell yeah. us more. Yeah, well, I talked with uh, some people. I have a, I also do have get, kind of like you, get low back and, hip pain from walking too much. I regularly see a massage therapist, which helps a lot. And she has fibromyalgia and has used it. And that's where I started thinking about it. Maybe I should seriously look at that. And then um, found some research. Uh, particularly, there was a study in Canada um, with MS patients with neuropathy where they found that there, there's a drug called, I think, Sativex that you can get in Canada. I mean, it's CBD and THC. Mm -hmm. So I started experience. I don't like the psychotropic effects of cannabis really at all. So I keep the dose low, but it, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So you I've, haven't actually had that conversation with? I have had the conversation okay. with doctors with, uh -huh. well, with Dr. Reyes mm -hmm. um, in particular. And uh, also I just saw Dr. Hagedorn, a urologist at Harborview and talked about it with relation to uh, bladder. Yeah. And they did a urodynamics on me and it's, things look really good. That was like last summer, but mm -hmm. things look good. That's great. Dr. Jones, can you just comment on that a little bit about kind of, you know, are you hearing more about people using cannabis for kind of pain and spasticity? And um, is that coming up a lot in terms of discussions? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, I think it's one of the hardest things as a provider to try to treat because it isn't necessarily curable. And I don't know if our meds are really all that helpful. And sort of run this gamut of like, oh, let's try going up, let's try going down, let's see what we can help fix. And, you know, these medications don't come without side effects. And so uh, trying to keep that in mind and just weighing what we can do. Um, you know, I will say just given the laws in Washington state that we can talk about this maybe a little bit more openly than other places. Um, you know, federal facilities can't necessarily talk about this. Um, I don't personally prescribe, but I definitely talk about it a lot with my patients. Um, I think that, just as Bruce said, I think there is a role for it. Sometimes it's a matter of titrating. I think if uh, my main thing and any of my patients with tetraplegia will know, like I'm very concerned for respiratory issues and so I don't really want someone inhaling um, for that reason, just for their own um, lung issues. But I do think that there is a role for some edibles and other forms um, within reason and after talking about it. Um, I do think it's important to talk about with your physicians. Um, I also just think it's important to talk about with other peers because I think you learn a whole lot more that from them than you can from me in a clinic. Um, but yeah, it can help with pain, it can help with spasticity, it can help with someone's mood, it may be a social experience for some people. Um, I think pain in general is an experience, it's not just one specific thing and so, you know, um, you're sort of talking about various things, ways you guys describe your pain. It's Some days it's gonna be worse if you are like, 
had a rough day at work or didn't sleep well or someone's stressing you out, I think that really contributes to that. And I think your nerves are a really big barometer for what's going on in your life. And so um, as much as we try to just treat the pain, I think there's also an ex a role of treating everything else going on as well. Bruce, can you just speak a little bit to this issue about kind of how do you take it? I don't know yeah, that we I, can say I that. Yeah, I take a, a liquid mm -hmm. um, that comes in a little bottle with a dropper in it. So I found it, that to be, and I actually get the right balance of THC to CBD and I mix it all up and then just, you know, measure it pretty accurately. So that that has worked a lot better than other things. I haven't tried um, smoking it or anything. It's always been like a liquid or a syrup kind of Yeah, and oral. I've had, um, sorry to interrupt, I think some patients have used it topically as well. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not as familiar with the dis how it sort of comes, but um, I've had that as well. Thanks. One of the other things that came up in our discussions, and I think Michelle and Ann, you really talked about um, the issue of fatigue um, and how much that has been different. And um, I actually am going to start with you, Ann, because um, you had said you were kind of, you didn't realize it was a common problem until fairly recently. And so can you kind of talk about your experience and then now being more aware of it, how what you've done to kind of manage that? Oh, so... Um before, I didn't realize it, but um, I went to the Spinal Cord Injury Summit, and then someone actually mentioned the problem of fatigue, and it's like, kind of like compare your energy to a battery, and now you have like a smaller battery, so if you do a lot of activity, then your battery run out faster. And I just realized, oh, I, I do have that experience as well. So now, um, now that I'm aware of it, I'm more, um, conscious in how I spend my energy and how I spend the how I go about doing the activities during my day and like how to get in like rest in between as needed to um, replenish my energy if I have a long day ahead so this. Michelle how about you oh, tired all the time <laughs> yeah and it's very frustrating it's very frustrating because, you know, there's just a lot of things that, you know, you want to do and uh, it's very limiting and I find that, you know, that's a very frustrating part of spinal cord injury. That it steals, you know, your kind of life away. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also pace myself and realize, okay, like if I get up in the morning, I've got like one activity I can do and then I'm going to need to rest and that activity, you know, may, may be the thing I do for the day. So I have to pace myself and uh, try also how I do the activity. Like if I take um, and use my chair instead of walk, even though I could walk, I use the chair because that's going to extend my day. Uh, I try to nap. I nap like like every day in the afternoon for maybe like two hours, which is a lot. But I just find like I need it, and otherwise my mood goes down, my pain goes up. So I just need that. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's all a whole system of activity there. Yeah. How much does that impact um, kind of your uh, coping with spinal cord injury and coping with and making these decisions that you all make about kind of um, walking versus using wheelchair and that? And I'm starting with you, Michelle, because you do have this um, kind of, you know, when do you use your wheelchair? You're kind of in this 50-50 mode. Yeah. Um, how does that impact that and how does it impact kind of how you feel like you're coping? Well, I mean, I really did find, like, when I got my wheelchair, that it uh, it was really pretty freeing for me. It was really freeing because it helped me with my pain and my fatigue and kind of stretched my, you know, stretched my window of things that I could get done, you know. I, uh, and so uh, I really appreciated that. And then I, you know, like, particularly at work, um, you know, spending so much time, like if I go from, you know, my office to a conference room or something, I would be thinking about the pain and the fatigue all the way there. And then as soon as I got my chair, you know, I could just be at my desk working and then zip over my conference room and my, my thoughts can just be constantly, you know, in the zone of work without having to worry about fatigue or pain so much or having my thoughts disrupted. So I've really found the chair being a real, 
extender of my day. So really that's just a big decision to use it or not. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like, we'll use it or not because then there's like the social implications of if I show up to my conference room in a chair, then like, what is that like? Or if I show up not in my chair, you know, what is, what impression does that make? And so there's just all these just decisions about when to use it and when not to use it. On for you, does that ever, or did it ever make a difference that, that impressions and social impressions about whether you walked versus using a wheelchair? Um, I think so. Um, I use my wheelchair when I have like a really long day of walking or like a long day of like doing a trip. So I feel like people do treat you differently when you use the wheelchair or when versus when you walk. And um, I, um, let's see. I think when you use a wheelchair, people kind of like assume that you need a lot more help than when I than when than when I use the uh, use the crutches. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I usually use wheelchair when I have someone with me because when I have like, a long day, then someone would be with me, even my family or my friends. Mm -hmm. So they tend to actually like kind of talk to that person and not like to me directly. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty interesting. But um, so I don't use the wheelchair that much if I can help it and normally. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, you're using it to allow you to do more, so it actually improves your ability, and yet it seems like it kind of makes you, people view you as being, needing more, mm -hmm. having more disability. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. And I see other people nodding. Jaden, how about you? I mean, you also split your time between wheelchair and walking, and how does that, how do those decisions get impacted by the social piece? Uh, so, when I'm going somewhere that I'm used to, I kind of have a routine of where I'm going to walk and where I'm going to use my chair. Uh, when I go somewhere new, uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll use my chair because I don't know what to expect. You know, it's like, oh, your first time here, we're going to go on a tour of the building, I better be in my chair. Uh, but then, uh, as I get used to a place, kind of needing to adjust and then people are like, like didn't know you could walk or they see you in a chair and they're like, oh, what happened? And I'm like, have you seen me walk? Uh, yeah, so just uh, going back and forth and uh, I don't really let it, let it bother me that it's, you know, people get used to it, my classmates are used to it. Um, yeah, so I just kind of do what's going to work for me. I use the chair for speed or if I want to keep up with people. Again, similar um, perception is different than your kind of goal. Yeah, perception is is different. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if people perceive me as more disabled walking or not. Sometimes people like congratulate me for leaving the home by myself when I'm walking, but I get stupid comments when I'm in my chair too. Ah, uh, you're dealing with humans, I hear. Right. <laughs> exactly. Bruce, I'm, you know, you and I talked a bit about kind of your experience at times. I mean, really, now you're up on your feet most of the time. Um, but you have had these experiences of over time, even from when you were newly injured using the wheelchair. Um, kind of what's your perception of this as well? Of how does that change kind of how people view you? Well, it... Uh it depends. I did have the experience I, about three and a half years ago, I fell and fractured my kneecap. Um, I, walked, I was walking with a, a cane for 10 years, and um, I would fall occasionally. And anyway, I was fully in the wheelchair for three months, so I got the experience of being back, you know, doing it, people wanting to help me do whatever. You know, I pull up to the car, I'm gonna get in there, can I help you? You know, here, here, let me, you know, and it's like, no, no, thank you. <laughs> You're, or, you know, there's a door and they wanna open the door for me and it's like, no, I'm perfectly capable of opening the door. And sometimes I, you know, it, I mean, it just reminded me of 
those things. I still experience that using the crutches. Um, people, um, you know, and I think people like to be helpful. I think maybe there's just a response that uh, I can't do anything for this person. Maybe I can, I, I don't know. But uh, I also had an experience that we talked about on the phone that uh, at the Working to Walk conference that was here in Seattle, it's a conference about spinal cord injury research that travels around the country. And it's gonna be in Vancouver in October, just to put in a plug. So if you want more, let me know, wanna know more. But it was here in Seattle and I went and I brought my wheelchair and I basically spent the conference in my wheelchair. And it's like, I felt like I was like part of the tribe in a way that when I'm walking um, with people around people who have spinal cord injuries, that's, you know, I'm kind of not, you know, it's not the norm. So that was really, um, that was really a nice experience actually to be able to connect with people um, mm -hmm. differently. Yeah. You all talked about this kind of limbo state of kind of living in this in-between place. Um, and, you know, I'm curious about kind of how you all have kind of worked on figuring out how to fit into, you know, being different than you're not fully up and walking all the time or without, I mean, being quote unquote normal, whatever that means. Um, but you're also not, um, you know, in a wheelchair. And how has it been for you know, people's, you know, how you've coped with those questions and your own kind of expectations of yourself and all of that. So, uh, Jaden, you want to respond to that? Yeah, so I was able to be on my feet all day by the time I was probably six months post-injury, maybe earlier. And as soon as I was able to, I kind of felt like I was supposed to be on my feet all the time. Uh, and then I kind of got to the point where I would like not want to go do things because it was just going to take forever. I couldn't keep up with anybody. Uh, and at that point, I started using my chair more and more just to have more independence, be able to do more things, have, uh, yeah, just be, have more, more enjoyment in life, be able to keep up with people. And it's, I mean, it's still something that, you know, when I go somewhere new, figuring out what's going to work best. But yeah, it took some, some time. And yeah, I feel like I'm still adjusting every time something new comes up. Yeah. Michelle, you're nodding. Well, yeah, just, I'm just thinking about the, like, what's going to work best this time? You know, that's really, you know, hard to decide. So, you know, it's been kind of weird because, like, the, you don't really know what your injury is going to be. And it seems like it's a, like it takes a long time to stabilize. So what it's like right when you're in the hospital and then, you know, one year out, two years out, and it just keeps changing, right? And so it's really kind of hard to, like, get a routine going or figure out what your new normal is because it keeps changing. And then, you know, how you treat it, you keep trying different things. So for pain or fatigue and you keep trying different things. So also it's, like, not quite normal. So it feels like... You know, hard time like just saying okay this is how it's going to be and so these are the things I'm going to do so I found that I don't know it just made it a little bit a little bit yeah a little bit strange mm -hmm. absolutely on Can you repeat a question mm -hmm. yeah in terms of just kind of how have you coped with this kind of in between about how other people see you how you see yourself um, in, being in this limbo um so for other people's expectation, I'm pretty used to like a lot of people like strangers stopping me like, oh, what happened? And then after I'm like, oh, it's a spinal cord injury or some, someone just straight up asking, oh, did you fall like a lot of time? Because they just assume it's a temporary thing versus when you're in a wheelchair. So um, sometime I would say it's a spinal cord injury and sometimes I don't feel answering that. I just say, yes, I fell. <laughs> then they just went, uh, and they just went ahead and started guessing, like, oh, did you fall from a car? Did you fall from a motorcycle? And then and it's always end up with, like, oh, get better soon. So um, I don't really spend my time correcting those people because they don't really have an impact on my life. 
But um, even for people that like in my family or acquaintances or friends that don't know me well, they still have the expectation that because I was able to use from moving from using the wheelchair to crutches that I'll get rid of the crutches soon. So um, a lot of time the expectation is like, oh, when are you gonna get rid of the crutches? And a lot of time they didn't really know that like spinal cord injury come with like, a lot more than just like beyond walking, there's different problem too. Mm -hmm. And if they're like a lot older or I don't know them that well still, so I don't really correct them too, <laughs> because it takes a lot of time, and it's, I feel like people don't have, don't actually have the understanding to um, kind of like empathize with these problems, and it just it just feel weird to be like actually you know I have this problem and this problem and this problem too, so it feels like a little bit of a downer. Mm -hmm. So I, I usually don't do that, but people that um, knows me well and friends that I grown closer with, um, we have discussion, and then they are able to understand. And it doesn't really have like a lot of like my injury doesn't have a lot of impact on the relationship that I have with the people that really matter. So um, for my regarding my own expectation, um. I'm really grateful for being able to use the crutches because it gave me a lot of flexibility and mobility and do a lot of things that I'm not able to, but that I would not be able to otherwise. Um, but some other time, I do need help from people. And um, I think I've grown used to accepting that mm -hmm. as like a new ability rather than like a disability mm -hmm. as a way of like moving forward. Yeah. Sounds like a really good approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what a couple things that a couple people have mentioned falling, and so Margaret, I think you uh, should close your ears again now. Um, so, uh, Bruce, you've had a few falls, mm -hmm. nothing too recently, right? No. But the other three of you, how? When's the last time you fell? Um, I don't fall that often. I actually practice getting up and down from the ground quite a bit, just like when I'm working out. And so uh, when I fall, it's usually because I'm like intentionally off balance and challenging myself. And if I do lose my balance, I can kind of control my way to the ground and I can get back up. So it's something I work on and it happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you you actually practice falling? Not so much falling, but getting onto okay. the ground, which, yeah. Perfect. Michelle? Mm, I don't know, sometime in the past maybe two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. I've had like this spate of falls recently. I don't know exactly why. Uh, but it's usually because I want to walk, I want to go somewhere, and then so, you know, I'd rather, I know it's probably not the best way to, like, to get from here to there, but I want to, and I can, and I have before, so why not like this time? So it's kind of like that, and then it's usually a, I don't know, I don't know, I just kind of like fell up the stairs today, I don't know why, I mean, you know, probably because I was going up the stairs with things in my hands, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not supposed to do, but we do, right? right? Because actually, you know, it takes so much energy to get from A to B. So I just want to like make one trip. So I like, carry as much as I possibly can from A to B because I know otherwise the fatigue of going like A to B, A to B is more. So I actually load up more. I don't know if you guys do that. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Common issue for yeah. everybody. Yeah. yeah. How about you, on? Um, I don't usually fall outside. I'm pretty good at catching myself with my crutches, even though like I almost fall outside like sometimes. But I I don't usually. But usually when I fall is like when I'm at home too, because when I'm at home I don't use my crutches, and I just like pan into the wall to walk, and then I do sometimes carry stuff too, like from here to there, and then that's when the fall usually happens. Mm -hmm. I think the last time I fall was like a few months ago. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just at home. Mm -hmm. So I was carrying a bowl of food. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and um, that was not fun cleaning up, but. <laughs> And I think, I mean, this is one of those things of um, it's that kind of pushing to be able to do what you want to do and not have to think about braces or crutches or whatever and um, pushing yourself, you know, even as you said, Jade, you're not falling, but, you know, kind of getting off balance because you're trying to do something maybe that's outside of the usual limit to get stronger, or be able to do more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Jones, if you have any kind of, I mean, I, you must hear this pretty regularly of people um, who are struggling with this, both this issue of kind of how do you manage in the world? And do you, do people come to you and ask about that, about recommendations about when to make these decisions to walk versus using wheelchair versus all of that or, um, or talk about um, falling as being part of that picture too? Um, I, I the answer, I think, is yes, people do talk to me. I think that um, we're very lucky in our system to have some really strong therapists who also really navigate that um, for us. And there's a number of really great therapists in the back. And I think that there are the eyes and ears trying to figure out how can we mitigate fall risk. If you've been in my clinic, you know that I say fall is a four-letter word. Um, and I, just because of the risk of secondary injury and what it can do to you in the long term, um, just a little bit of sort of thinking about what uh, you guys have been saying is that it may not be asked of me, but that it may come up that as the provider, we are talking about energy conservation, and that's a conversation that therapy may start, and then the providers have to reinforce, and at times it doesn't make sense because you're like, oh, I just need to move forward, you know, and someone with a new injury just wants to move forward and do what they can, and, you know, sort of the obligation to walking that you sort of mentioned. Um, but I think as you stabilize, as you guys mentioned, that you sort of figure out what works, what doesn't, when is pain more flared, when, you know, may fatigue may be an, an issue, and um, that may be a conversation that a physician's talking about, or a provider's talking about energy conservation that someone may not want to listen to. Um, but it comes up, and it comes up for people that are ambulating, it comes up for people that maybe are manual wheelchair users that are thinking about transitioning to power wheelchairs, so I think it really does affect um, these sort of transitions of like when to use what resource um, is something that impacts everyone with spinal cord injury. Um, but yeah, the other side of it, just sort of as a provider is just, if someone's describing more and more falls, then like what else might there be going on? Just because if someone was injured when they were 20 and then they gained a few pounds and now they're 50, like they might have diabetes and a neuropathy. Like, you know, there's, there's other medical things and I think that's an important reason to discuss some of this stuff with your provider as well. So along those lines, I mean, you know, have you guys really thought about issues related to aging and and related to like how does this impact you over time? I mean, obviously, you know, everybody's had a lot of changes already, um, and I think anticipating other things may come in the future. And so I'm curious about kind of, you know, I, I'm going to start with on just because you're the youngest here. Um, do you even think about aging with your spinal cord injury or um, think about having to think about joint protection or anything like that? Um, to be honest, I have not put a lot of thought into it. But um, I'm thinking about my health more because I'm getting older too. So like I'm trying to do more exercises and try to eat better mm -hmm. to um, kind of like get better, get healthier. Mm -hmm. But regarding, um, regarding joint health, I did not put a lot of thoughts in it yet. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Michelle? I'm worried about getting older because I don't really know well, I don't know what's going to happen, and I haven't really looked into it a little too much because I kind of don't want to know. <laughs> you know, a little bit, right? But I do worry about it, and uh, you know, I just wonder what that's going to be like if I'm already like this and I'm older. What's going to happen? And I tell kids or young people now: make sure you check the box for long-term care insurance before you get injured. Yeah, I wish I had done that because I, I didn't think about it, and so now I really worry about that. Yeah, absolutely. How much care we'll need. Yeah. How about you, Jaden? Uh, 
I know, like, as far as joints, like, I was prone to overuse injuries with my shoulders before I got injured. And so now, like, being active in sports, I just kind of listen to my body. If I need to take it easy, I'll back off a little bit. I do a lot of exercises to just kind of protect them, figuring out what makes them feel better. Um, and how about you, Bruce? Oh yes. Well, I'm I'm 62 years old now, so it's you know it's, it's becoming happening. more real. And uh, um, you know, given all I've been through, I'm in probably pretty good shape. But I am I see a bone metabolism doctor to make sure that I'm not losing too much uh, too much bone density, and uh, you know other. Other things, like I said, like I mentioned earlier, I do see a massage therapist regularly that helps with the aches and pains and just keeps things more aligned. And so I do think about <coughs> that and wonder, you know, how is it going to be? When I, I was 45 when I was injured and it felt like suddenly I'm twice my age. I'm a 90-year-old person, you know, dealing with all these things that just seemed, and then maybe I think I've, come back a few years, but it still, you know, is definitely on my mind and thinking about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to live uh, in the coming years. Common issue. No. And Dr. Jones, is that something that you tend to talk with folks about too as they come in up for annual evaluations as well? Um, I think yes and no. I think it depends on the person and sort of where they are, because if they're still working through an injury, it's hard to be like, well, you know, in 50 years, although I do that a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, again, some of these secondary complications are just pretty rough, and I think staying on this side of it helps keep people out of the hospital, um, and I think that can be helpful. I think. Um, Aging in general is just really a tough, it's tough to go through and I think add a spinal cord injury onto it and you're, you're talking more about caregiving perhaps and then also who are your caregivers and how old are they and how much stress is that putting on their body versus um, my patients and their needs. Um, so yeah, I, I think we have to touch on it a little bit in various aspects of sort of general health maintenance, but you know, you also have to just have to cater to your audience and some people are just really in the moment and working through being a full-time whatever and doing whatnot and you can't think about like the golden years quite yet. Well, I have like a dozen more questions to ask, but we're getting uh, close to the hour and I do wanna give the audience time to ask questions. So I want to ask you guys all to tell me what advice you'd have for somebody who is newly injured and um, there's some question about whether or not they might be able to be walking and uh, what are the things that you maybe wished you had heard or given what your experience has been so far, um, kind of what advice would you have for them? Bruce, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, I don't know that there's anything I wished I had done, but I think in my case, my recovery was a, was a long, was over really four years. I left Harborview unable to sit up by myself. Uh, the idea of walking seemed far, you know, way out, but I just found, well, okay, I'm getting a millimeter here, so maybe I can make it to... Um, you know, and then three. Um, and I just, you know, I mean, I guess the thing is maybe just to keep, you know, pushing. I, I guess, you know, I was, I think, realistic. I figured probably I'm not going to be able to walk again, especially early on. But, but if, I just thought if it's possible, I'll do what I can. And um, so... You know, I guess it's, you know, don't give up, but also, you know, be realistic and don't overdo it. Because I overdid it, too. <laughs> On, how about you? Um, 
I think there's like two things that I would like to say. Like the first thing is that when you first get injured, there's a lot of things happening, and you are like overwhelmed. You feel like you are not in control of a lot of things. So maybe try to be patient with yourself and give yourself some time to process all of this before like trying to do many things at once. But the second thing is like once you get the hang of it, like you can try things as long as it's safe. Um, the reason that I started walking full time was that I was going to class and I was waiting outside about a very crowded hall and I was like super frustrated of seeing all everyone's butts. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I went home and I told my parents I like, I think next tomorrow I'm gonna use crutches to walk to classes. And like it just started from there. So my doctor did not give me the go ahead yet. And it was like pretty hard first couple of days, but um it was it was one <laughs> and I was able to do it so as long as it's safe and just try things so I think that's what I have to say yeah. uh, I guess I would say you know like that there's a super overwhelming feeling in the beginning there's so much and there's so many feelings, so much to deal with, so much sadness, and at least for me, like the injury itself seemed to be like all-consuming. It's just every aspect, and I felt like the I am my injury for a long time. But you know, that that kind of that does go away, and there at some point where you do kind of get a new normal, and you do your injury is still a big part of your life, but there's there is other stuff, and you do. I mean, you can still have a fulfilling life with a spinal cord injury, and that seems like not possible. Like when they tell you that in the beginning, I'm sure someone in your staff said that to me, and I'm like, yeah, right. Uh, but eventually, you're like, okay, I could see that. So that does come. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm gonna give sort of opposite advice, like the yes. So you can push yourself, and you want to do more, and you want to keep trying things, but. Um, I think there's also uh, to accept the help and the devices and the limitations of pacing yourself or you know, using a chair or uh, medication or whatever to also use those things because it ends up actually giving you more of your life that you can enjoy. Uh, and you don't have to like push yourself all the time just because you can, right? So it's kind of freeing some of the devices. Um, or the meds or the methodologies, they're, they give you more of life. Uh, I would just say that that takes time to see where you're going to end up. You don't know where you're going to end up. Um, and that wherever you do end up, that a life can still be really great. So I, it's just going to take time to, to find that new normal. All right, let's open it up to questions. So what are your thoughts about the intensive walking or exoskeleton programs that are out? Um, I'm gonna direct this to Bruce um, because you were involved in a program, right? Um, well, yeah, uh, a, number, a number of things. I, I uh, about three and a half years post-injury, I was in a clinical trial in the University of Florida doing up body weight supported treadmill training intensively for like three months, which did make a big difference to me. And then I also was on the board of pushing boundaries over in Redmond for 10 years. So was involved in it from really the beginning through. So um, I, I've, I, I, I'm not familiar with exoskeletons or things like that, but um, what I've seen is that even, no matter where you are, it seems like recovery is more the norm than, I mean, you, people recover something. It may not be what you want. It never is what you want. What, what, what we want is to be, you know, made whole. But, uh, but still, the little things can make such a big difference. 
How about any of the rest of you? I don't think we talked about that. Have any of you done any of the either studies or tried exoskeleton or done any of the other kinds of programs? Um, I haven't used like an exoskeleton or anything. I have worked out at pushing boundaries. Um, I think it's you know valuable to push your body to see where you can end up, but also not to necessarily fixate on that. Like you don't need to dedicate your life to walking normally. You know, even if it could happen, if I'm going to dedicate years of my life to it, is it worth it? Maybe not. Any thoughts on that? Either of you, Michelle, are on? No? I'd love to be able to try it once. Mm -hmm. I'd love to try the exoskeleton. I think that'd be awesome. And I'd love to try like an intensive program. I mean, if it would fit into my life, that's another thing. But I don't know, one day if I had lots of time, I think that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you're- Can't hurt. Maybe when your kids are off to school- exactly, and, and yeah. you're retired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is one of the difficulties, right? It's the finding the time, because to take three months out of your life is, is a big chunk of your time yeah. to go elsewhere too, right? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay. So the question is, have you reached your new normal, or are you still um, on the improving or changing kind of plateau? And I'll just go along. So Jaden, can you answer that? Yeah, so I still do see small noticeable changes um, and I think sometimes other people interpret that as you're going to be running again someday and you know I you know I do see small improvements but I don't have any like end goal you know I I work out all the time because I enjoy it and progress is great um, so you know yeah changes are still happening and yeah yeah and you're how many years out now six six years out yeah how about you, Michelle? Mm, yeah, I think I still see changes for the better. Uh, I'm 10 years out. I think my I think my feeling is better. You know, you know, it's just in gray. It's gray. It's in gray. But I think, well, I think my feeling is is better, and surprisingly so. You know, like, oh, well, really? I can feel that. Wow. And I, I know I couldn't in the beginning. So. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ann? Um. So I think. I started exercising and I feel like it does get a little better, but I'm not sure if it's like the ability that like the recovery or it's just like muscle that you exercise that you gain more. Mm -hmm. But either way, like I think there's a little bit of improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Exercise can make mm -hmm. a big difference in a lot of things and um, can help. Yeah, absolutely. And you're four and a half years out, right? I think so. 2013, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm uh, 17 years um, out, and I, I, I'm i stable. I think I did, a few years ago, notice I was started working downtown and riding the bus and walking a little more, and for a while seemed to get maybe, I think I can walk a little farther now than I maybe could five years ago, but... I think neurologically I'm stable, mm -hmm. which at my age I'll take. <laughs> right, no decline. No that's decline, good. yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Dr. Jones, I'm curious, would you answer that as well about kind of, at, do you ever expect people? I mean, is it is it a certain time post-injury or certain age post-injury or can people still see change kind of over time? loaded question um, <laughs> I think for newly injured folks so there's been a really big sort of shift to older people older people getting injured because of falls and related to stenosis and whatnot so the average age of injury is like really increased by almost 15 years in the last 30 years which is a testament to how many older people are doing it so I think in terms of like neuroplasticity, I think older people have a longer, you know, sometimes with younger folks will say how you are at about a year is maybe how it's going to be. But I think with my older patients, I will give them longer. If someone's more incomplete, I might talk about a longer time frame. Um, you know, when we do our clinical evaluation, we can do a neurologic exam and sort of show that maybe things are stable with time at a year or at two years. But I think there's a lot of little things that I can't see in my clinical my clinic room that 
matters. And so if you're talking about small gains or increased walking or, you know, all of those are really important gains to you. It's just not something I can measure by doing a physical exam. Um, you know, and I think the same can be said for like changes in spasticity, perhaps improvement over time if someone is walking more or stretching more or doing a new activity. Um, and so I do think that there can be those changes. I think in general, we do talk about most of the recovery happening earlier on. Um, I don't like to close doors and I also like to really be wrong. So when people show me things that have changed over time, that's fine too. Yeah, I'll say like the majority of my improvement was after about six months and it's been smaller stuff since then, but it was the bulk of it was in six months. Mm -hmm. Is that true for yeah. others too? I mean, your Bruce is a little bit um, different because really, the lot of your improvement happened yeah, months and yeah. yeah, even one, two, three years. Yeah, yeah. It was a long yeah post injury a long haul. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions. So has anybody used the Lima strap or the uh, walk aid um, devices and, and any benefit from that for foot drop? Yeah, so I use the Bioness for foot drop. I've had it for six years and I love it. I can walk without it, but it's a lot slower and I'm a lot more likely to trip. So yeah, I use it every time I'm walking, I love it. It's the Bioness. It's similar to the Walk Aid. It's for foot drop. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because that actually has a electrical stimulation, correct? It does, yeah. Yeah, so it, uh, I have the older version. So there's a weight sensor under the heel, and then it has uh, electrodes just below the knee. So when, I, when my heel comes off the ground, then it stimulates those muscles to clear the toes as I step through. And it, it gets my foot in a good position for landing. Yeah. And I know that you, we can see that you have your brace on. Tell me about a little bit about the kind of, have you had that type of brace the whole time or have you changed up at all? Um, so when I was discharged from the hospital, I would just have the ankle brace to um, prevent my ankle from rolling inward and it didn't help anything with the walking. So once I have this brace, it like helps a lot. I had, I used to have both on both legs and it helps a lot with like walking instant, like right away. Mm -hmm. So I've had this for a few years, and it has a spring attached so that um, the um, flexibility can be adjusted. So this one is pretty stiff because my foot dropped too. So, um, but the other one I used to have had is have um, a lot of flexibility on the foot on this side, right. and it helped with my foot drop, and it also helped with like prevent my knee from like going too far. Forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't use a stimulation device, but I do have a AFO uh, called a Blue Rocker. It's an off-the-shelf carbon fiber um, thing, mm -hmm. and it, it does help both with foot drop and for me also with knee hyperextension, which actually is more the reason why I use it because that um, that can really destroy your body much, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, and so it it uh, without it, I uh, I think like Jaden said, I can't walk that far or mm -hmm. that fast. It makes a big difference. Yeah, Michelle, how about you? Uh, I had an AFO, but I found um, it was just really impractical. I didn't notice that it helped that much because uh, it's my foot, but it's also my knee, and it's my hip, so it's like the whole leg. I'm sure it would help, uh, but it just didn't seem that practical. Uh, didn't really go with my work clothes, then I had my work clothes, then I get my like kid clothes, and I don't know, just like all the changing, and it just didn't, it didn't, like the benefit of it and the practicality, they didn't seem to balance out. Although, if it helps with falls, obviously that would be great to avoid them. But it wasn't like, you know, I hear Jaden saying, wow, it really improves his walking. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'd like to try that. Right. Yeah. 
So I guess to Dr. Jones, you know, how, like all these different options, um, how are those decisions made? Is that made by the physician or by the physical therapist or both? I actually want to give a shout out to one of my patients who's in here and taught me a lot about some AFOs that she's using. So um, I think it's an ongoing uh, learning curve, both with a therapist and with patients and talking to people in forums and all these other things. Um, I, I, in our system at least, I think we do a nice job of talking both with the orthotist and our physical therapist to really figure out what might work best for somebody and being able to trial certain things such as the blue rocker versus a solid ankle versus some more higher advanced ones. I think what can be hard because I think the walk aids can be really quite helpful. Um, insurance does not always cover them and that's unfortunate in our, that it has to be part of the conversation. And so sometimes you have to show failure with X, Y, and Z, failure, quote unquote, um, be it them not working or not using them or them causing pain or skin issues before we can get to that walk aid. But they do, they can be helpful for some people. And I think the same can be said for some of these, you know, there's a lot of different materials coming out now and some like, fancy stuff coming around for folks, which I think is great. It's just expensive and insurance doesn't want to cover it. And so you, like I have to just write a very like thorough letter of why I think it's super important for this to happen. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very, it's a big team concept, especially as someone might evolve, you know, they, these AFOs are not cheap. Um, even just the off the shelf one, I think is close to $800. Uh, if you didn't have insurance paying for it. So <laughs> um, getting a custom made one is, yeah, and if, I mean, we've someone else is showing their KFO. Um, it is a big deal to get those made. And um, so if someone is evolving, they may sort of grow out of one versus another, and that's a lot. And it's just a lot of time for people, too, to have to, like, go back and have further evaluations and figuring it out. So it's, it's a hard conversation, but it can be important because it can help with walking or falls or whatever. Jaden, can you speak a little bit to that? Like, at what point did you get the Bioness, and like, did insurance pay for it, or did you have to? Yeah, so I got it about nine months post injury, and uh, it wasn't covered by insurance, but it made a big enough difference that it was worth it. And you know, I've had it for six years, and it's well worth it. Do they do loaners of those things? You could try them out for long I, enough to know. I tried it out in physical therapy. Um, I think that was that was it, but uh, yeah, I got a refurbished one, which cost a lot less. Yeah. So w the company worked with you and your therapist to yeah um, to find something that would be refurbished. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So can you talk about your access to physical therapy and whether insurance has kind of limited or did limit um, any of your ability to get the level of therapy that you wanted and the quality of therapy um, so people with experience with spinal cord injury. Um, I'll start with Bruce. Yeah, it was an issue because I think my insurance covered $2,000 a year for physical therapy. And I was fortunate both to have had some resources myself and resources in my family to help because I was on the eighth floor up here three days a week for two to three hours a time for a year and a half or more. And, you know, I needed uh, that much to, to, to realize what happened. With, without it, I would not have, you know, with, uh, and at that time there weren't other, really other options, you know, paid out of pocket or not. So. Um, yeah, it was, it was an issue. How about you, Ann? Um, <clears throat> I think I had the same, um, the same issue. Like, when I got discharged, um, I didn't have that good of insurance. So, like, the amount of physical, ther physical therapy that I was able to get here is pretty limited. But, like, fortunately, we had um, the transition program here. So I was able to use the transition program to do a lot of exercises and more physical therapy after. Um, in addition to the physical therapy that I get on the eighth floor. And then after that, um, I was able to sign up for the University of Puget Sound, the um, pro bono physical therapy clinic 
that they have for their students. And um, the drive was pretty, was pretty long, but um, it was very helpful for me to be able to get um, the physical therapy exercises there for a while. How long did you continue physical therapy? Um, over there or? In total, from the time um, of your injury to? I think I started here and then I got pretty regular physical therapy exercises here for about a year or a year to a year and a half. And then I continued to at the University of Puget Sound for I think three more quarter with them or mm -hmm. three more semester. Mm -hmm. So that was like another year, year and, and a half. half. Yeah. I was really fortunate to have very good insurance at the time of the accident, and uh, so the, I wasn't limited in the number of sessions, which I feel super thankful for. Uh, so I have continued physical therapy since the accident on a super regular basis, you know, like once or twice a week, you know, throughout, maybe taking some breaks, but just keep continuing, and I found that's super, super helpful. Insurance changing a little bit now, so now I'm a little bit worried about how that's going to change, but we'll deal with that. Um, well, I thought it seems to be an issue of finding um, a neurophysical therapist. There just aren't that many. I mean, the ones here um, at Harborview and at U are awesome, but there's just so much need, right? And you can't, like, we can't all see them twice a week, you know, it's like for all the years of our injury. So, but there aren't that many in the community. So that, I think that's a bit of an issue. Uh, so I also fortunately had great insurance through my work at the time of my accident. Um, and so uh, after I was discharged, I did outpatient therapy down at Good Sam for a year. And uh, at that point it was, I was kind of doing more stuff on my own than they, so it wasn't, really that beneficial and so I stopped at that point and just kept doing stuff on my own. Um, I, th I think it's really tough to find the right access to the right people um, because we get so many people from a very large catchment area and so you're talking about where they might be discharging to. Um, I mean Michelle actually was a resource for me to have an understanding of some neuro rehab PTs out in the community that might be on the east side or might be elsewhere outside of our, because not everyone can come to the U, it's just a pain in the rear sometimes to come downtown. Um, and I think that word of mouth thing can really be helpful. I, I have other patients that, you know, they may have a new, they may have their spinal cord injury, but a new sort of back issue or something, and so might send them along to more of like an ortho PT at that point. Um, you know, I think a little bit of it is just a conversation with your provider. You know, Washington State, you can actually self-refer to physical therapy, and so some of that's just a little, figuring out for yourself, but it is hard to know who's going to understand a spinal cord injury for sure. So with changes in kind of joints and sensation issues and things like that, how much are you and your doctors kind of working together to monitor joint protection and joint health? Um, and um, so I'll start with Jaden this time. I, I feel like I've mostly taken the lead. Like if something's bothering me, I, I, took the initiative to tell my doctor, I was like, hey, can I see a physical therapist because I want to get a brace for this. Um, yeah, as far as like bone density, that's been more my initiative. I went and got it tested and then showed the results to my doctor. So it's been more of me when, I, when something bothers me or when I get curious, then I go to my doctor. But I'm also not in close contact with my doctor. So it's like, if I have a reason to contact them when I will. Yeah. Jane, do you um, have a primary care provider that's your primary person, or do you have a spinal cord injury doctor, or do you have both? I, well, I've kind of jumped around to different doctors, but I have one rehab doc that I've stuck with, and yeah. Michelle? No, joint issues haven't really been a topic. I don't know why. You know, I don't use my arms for a wheelchair that much, and I don't know why it just hasn't. It hasn't been an issue, or hasn't been a topic. I don't know, maybe it should be, but I don't feel like I'm... <laughs> Dr. Jones. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. If I, yeah. For your next... Yeah. Oh, my hips. Oh, sorry. Hips are joints. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Hips. Surprising. Oh, yeah. Hips. Yeah. 
Hips are surprising because I didn't have hip issues in the beginning, but I hip, had hip pain over time, and I don't know why. But yeah, that's a joint issue. Yes, that is joints. Thank you. That is <laughs> It's a joint. <laughs> So um, it sounds like you've, when something's come up as an issue, but in terms of kind of thinking about some of the prevention or monitoring, that necessarily not that has not necessarily come up. It hasn't been top of my mind though. No. Yeah, absolutely. How about you? Um, it has not really come up until recently when I was talking to my doctor and physical therapist about possibly switching to the same place that he's having, but um, after trying it out and then. They said that it's like hyperextend my knee backward a little bit too much for comfort. That's why like they brought out like joint, and they said that you should like I should look out for it more, because like going forward to the future that might not be a good thing. But other than that, it doesn't come up that often. Yeah, I guess I really haven't had joint issues either. I mean, like I said, I mentioned I get regular massage and probably have for about ten years. Um, and that's probably helped me, but yeah, yeah. but not specifically. And I, have, and I do have good sensations, so if something is wrong, I do know. Right. So, from a little bit of a provider perspective, you know, when we talk about the bladder, we talk about like need for yearly surveillance or things like that. There isn't like a formal recommendation of like we should get regular x-rays or we should get regular nerve testing or anything like that. Um, you know, I think part of it is just having a really good conversation with your provider if it is a matter of like you feel like your back might be bothering you because you're walking a different way or something like that. Um, you know, think about those biomechanical changes that have happened over time just can have issues many, many years down the line. Um, but again, kind of goes back to that conversation of like, does somebody want to hear it, you know, or is it, if they're kind of, if they're coming in with four other issues, it may not be something that comes up, but it certainly is something that we, we as providers should be thinking about. And again, I think that's another place where therapies can help to have that conversation as well. Um, so the question is um, kind of where, how long were you in inpatient rehab and kind of how did you gather resources as you left inpatient rehab to kind of get to the place you are now? Um, so I'll start with Ann. Oh, okay. Um, when I, I was in inpatient rehab for four, two, three months, three months from October to December. And when I left it, um, I was able to use, I was using the wheelchair almost one time, but I was able to use a walker to stand up and walk like short distances. And uh, a lot of my resources came from the UW Medicine and the rehab clinic over here, because I continue working with the physical therapist here and then people um, and occupational therapists and everyone here helped me figure out like where to go from there. How about you, Michelle? Uh, I was in I was in inpatient therapy for you know, just a month, and then uh, outpatient therapy through Harborview. I don't know, maybe another six months. I can't really remember. And then they helped me find resources in the community. Mm -hmm. And when you left inpatient, you were walking. Yeah. With uh, what device? My cane. I was the cane at that time. Thank you. Jaden? I was inpatient for about six weeks. And when I left, I could walk a little bit using a walker, but I needed someone's hands on me to safely do it. And then I was in outpatient therapy for a year. Uh, but I was introduced to adaptive sports while I was still inpatient. And so I was able to kind of get a lot of information just from that community. Um, yeah, and then just uh, in outpatient therapy, like my therapists would be on the lookout for different resources they thought would be interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So connecting with peers was real helpful to kind of learn about the resources. You're nodding as well, Michelle, is yeah. that? Uh, I was in Harborview for two and a half months. I mean, probably the first month was really acute care and then rehab. 
And when I left, I think I mentioned I, I couldn't sit up by myself. Um, upstairs, then I, I did outpatient uh, upstairs. And it was nine to 10 months when they first just like got me on my feet in the parallel bars and I started taking a little bit of walking. Um, and it was then still, you know, another two plus years of therapy here and then the trip to Florida. And also it was, it was a long, long haul. Yeah, and so connection to other resources. I mean, how did you find out about the studies and how did you find out about um, some of the other programs that you took advantage of? Um, well, the, the study in Florida, my wife found on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a good resource uh, for all kinds of things like that. Um, and other things I found networking with people here um, and other other places. Um, the SCI forum that was an important thing for me early in recovery, mm -hmm. especially. So yeah. I'm glad it's still <laughs> going on, even though I don't show up mm -hmm. very often anymore. But it's really was really a very important thing. We still know where to find you, clearly. Yeah, you do. <laughs> You know, I, just to kind of add on to that, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we um, have continued this for is to really hear from people with the experience, the lived experience, because while our experts are fabulous and really helpful, um, I think there's a lot that can be offered by, um, you know, peers and other people who have experienced that. And so I'm curious about, like, you very early got connected with a peer network while you were inpatient. And Michelle, you were nodding, saying, oh, that does kind of sound familiar. Um, have you stayed connected with peers as well? I mean, I, we know that Jade's still doing rugby and still busy with that. And, um, you know, uh, Bruce has talked about kind of still staying connected with uh, Working to Walk and some of those other um, organizations and um, others. But how about you? Yeah, I'm connected to a couple people that were injured around the same time with around the same kind of injury, and we've stayed connected over the years, and that's been a really nice, nice connection. Mm -hmm. I would say it seems like it seems really important while you're still in, you know, early, early portion to find somebody, or but like even later. I mean, even tonight, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, this, you know, you also have feel like you know you're in a tribe, yeah. and it feels good. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, On? Um, I did not actually have like connected with people that <clears throat> went through the same thing. So like after I got discharged, I started going back to school and doing everything and it was just really busy. So I did not get a chance to. So like most of the resources that I found was through the uh, inpatient, the outpatient, inpatient and outpatient rehab here at the UW. Yeah, so, so the therapists and all the team. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, we are at the end of our time tonight, and I just want to have everybody join me in a round of applause for this great panel.